have disruption of the bony pelvis that does tend to tear the bladder at its fascial attachments, and bone fragments can also directly lacerate the organ. Other important causes of bladder rupture include penetrating trauma, iatrogenic surgical complications, such as what we're talking about today, and then spontaneous rupture can occur in patients with a history of pre-existing bladder disease, prior urologic surgery, or radiation. So blunt trauma, bladder injuries that occur with blunt trauma are rarely isolated injuries. 80 to 94 percent of these patients have significant associated non-urologic injuries. Mortality in these patients is quite high and is usually related to non-urologic injuries, can go up to 44 percent. And the most common associated injury is a pelvic fracture, which is associated with 83 to 95 percent of bladder injuries. Conversely, however, bladder injury has only been reported in 5 to 10 percent of pelvic fractures. Penetrating bladder trauma is also associated with significant non-urologic injuries such as bowel and vascular injuries and has a high mortality rate as well. Almost half of penetrating bladder injuries are iatrogenic and obstetric and gynecologic complications are the most common causes of bladder injuries during open surgery. Uh, bladder rupture is not something that usually occurs as an isolated asymptomatic event in normal individuals. Conscious patients do tend to present with pronounced nonspecific symptoms, such as suprapubic pain that is combined with an inability to void. Physical signs include suprapubic tenderness, lower abdominal bruising, muscle guarding and rigidity, and then diminished bowel sounds. Some of your associated abdominal and pelvic injuries may mask bladder symptoms. You must have a higher suspicion for bladder injury in patients who are unresponsive due to altered sensorium or intoxication. Immediate catheterization should be performed when, when a blunt bladder rupture is suspected because the most reliable indicator is gross hematuria, which is present in nearly all cases. However, if blood is noted at the meatus or if the catheter is unable to pass easily, retrograde urethrography should be performed because urethral injuries do concomitantly occur in 10 to 29 percent of patients with a bladder rupture. So imaging of the bladder should be performed on the basis of clinical suspicion. After blunt external trauma, your absolute indication for immediate cystography is gross hematuria associated with a pelvic fracture. Approximately 29% of these patients with this combination uh, will be found to have bladder rupture. Relative indications for cystography after blunt trauma include gross hematuria without a pelvic fracture and microhematuria with a pelvic fracture. The diagnosis of bladder rupture in these atypical patients is quite low. For example, it's 0.6% in patients with a pelvic fracture and microhematuria, but your index suspicion should be raised. Uh, conversely, penetrating injuries of the buttock, pelvis, or lower abdomen with any degree of hematuria should warrant cystography. Retrograde cystography is nearly 100% accurate for a bladder injury if it is performed appropriately, and what will be seen with extra peritoneal extravasation will be dense, flame-shaped collection of contrast material in the pelvis. This is characteristic is seen here. So depending on your fascial integrity, contrast material may actually extend beyond the confines of the pelvis and be visualized in the retroperitoneum, scrotum, phallus, thigh, or the abdominal wall. It's important to remember that the amount of extravasation is not always proportional to the extent of bladder injury. And here you can see it extending down. So CT is something that we all know is routinely used to assess trauma patients. So concomitant CT cystography is frequently selected because it's more efficient uh, in terms of assessing the bladder. It is as accurate and reliable as plain film cystography in the evaluation as long as the bladder is filled in a retrograde fashion and your contrast material must be diluted to 2 to 4 percent. Dilution of the contrast material is mandatory because undiluted contrast material is so dense that the CT quality will be compromised by the scouter artifact. It's also important to note that clamping the urethral catheter in an attempt to allow antegrade distension of the bladder is inadequate for the diagnosis of bladder rupture. Retrograde filling is required. So in, here's an example. We see intraperitoneal extravasation where contrast material can outline the loop of bowels. And um, you can also visualize the lower lateral portion of the peritoneal cavity. 
So on to management, the usual treatment of an uncomplicated extraperitoneal bladder rupture when your conditions are ideal is conservative management with urethral catheter drainage alone. A large bore, uh, 22 French Foley catheter should be used to promote adequate drainage. If output is poor, fluoroscopic cystography should be considered to ensure that proper catheter placement has been achieved. Cystography is necessary to verify complete healing before catheter removal uh, 10 to 14 days after the injury as usual, and occasionally extravasation may persist for several weeks. Um, it usually does, res it will resolve with continued urethral catheter drainage and radiographic confirmation of healing is essential. So all penetrating, um, Oh, I'm sorry. Multiple studies have reported that there are actually fewer complications with the management of extraperitoneal rupture, um, such as sepsis, fistula, and clot retention if there is actually an open repair versus conservative management. So if you have a stable patient that is undergoing exploratory laparotomy for other injuries or for internal fixation of a pelvic fracture, they recommend surgical repair of the rupture at that time. So to do that, the anterior bladder wall is entered, a cystotomy is made, and the tear is closed intravesically with absorbable suture. And then drainage of the bladder is performed with a large bore Foley catheter. And then cystography is done one to two weeks afterwards to verify healing. Excuse me. All penetrating or intraperitoneal injuries that result from external trauma should be managed by immediate operative repair. There was a study that showed um, nationally in patients with bladder trauma, operative repair was associated with a 59% reduction in mortality. These injuries are often larger than suggested on cystography and are unlikely to heal spontaneously. So, and continued leak of the urine can cause a chemical peritonitis. When bladder injuries are explored after a penetrating trauma without preliminary imaging, the ureteral orifices should be inspected for clear efflux. Ureteral integrity also can be tested by intravenous administration of methylene blue or retrograde passage of a ureteral catheter. So in the trauma setting, which is more relevant here, um, Closure of the bladder is usually performed in a two-layer fashion. With an iatrogenic injury, some surgeons will do it in one layer, but two layer is still preferred. In either manner, a running suture is placed to obtain a watertight closer, closure, and only absorbable suture should be used on the bladder. Permanent sutures serve as a nidus for later stone formation and infection, which is seen here in the picture. After that, a perivesical drain should be employed. Antimicrobial agents are administered for three days in the perioperative period, and then a cystogram is again obtained seven to 10 days after injury. So there are some serious complications associated, and it's usually with a delayed diagnosis or treatment because of a delayed presentation of misdiagnosis or for some complex injuries that result from devastating pelvic trauma. Unrecognized injuries um, manifest as fever and sepsis, azotemia, acidosis, low urine output, peritonitis, ileus, urinary ascites, or occasionally respiratory difficulties. An unrecognized bladder neck, vaginal, and rectal injuries associated with bladder rupture can result in incontinence, fistula stricture, and then difficult delayed major reconstruction. And then severe pelvic fractures may cause a transient or permanent neurologic injury and result in voiding difficulties despite an adequate repair. So back to our case, our patient was taken to the OR for exploratory laparotomy as well as cystoscopy with bilateral retrograde pylograms to evaluate the integrity of the ureters. Uh, on a, uh, upon going to the OR, a rigid cystoscope was used to inspect both the urethra and the bladder. Bladder mucosa was found to be very abnormal with the appearance of fat, a distorted trigone, and an open cystotomy which communicated with the abdomen. During cystoscopy, bowel and fallopian tubes were visualized through the cystotomy. Bilateral ureteral orifices were found, but with difficulty, and retrograde pylograms were performed and did not demonstrate any ureteral injury. At that time, sensor wire and fluoroscopy were used to place bilateral 6 by 26 double J stents with the strings removed. Cystoscope was removed and a Foley was placed. We then turned to the open part of a case where a midline incision was made with a 10 blade from just superior to the umbilicus down to the symphysis. Cautery was used to dissect down the sub Q to the fascia. Fascia was incised and upon entering the peritoneum, a large amount of urinary ascites was encountered. Uh, which was removed with suction. Our incision was then carried down 
to the inferior extent of our skin excision, a book walter was replaced, and the bowel was packed superiorly for exposure with trauma lapse. The bladder defect was immediately visible and the Foley balloon could be visualized through the abdomen through the defect. The bladder was mobilized and a vertical cystotomy was made in the anterior wall to be able to visualize the uh, inside of the bladder mucosa. The edges of the defect were cut sharply with Metzenbaum scissors to assure bleeding edges uh, as there was a degree of cautery artifact from the pre prior repair. A zero vicral suture was used to close the bladder mucosa in a running fashion. It was imbricated in a similar manner for a second layer closure. The bilateral stents were seen to be uninvolved and moved freely within the bladder lumen. The vertical anterior cystotomy we had created for maximal visibility was then closed with a ovicral suture in two layers in a similar manner. A new Foley catheter was then placed, the balloon was inflated, and then the catheter irrigated easily with no leak seen. A pedicle of perivesical fat from the left lateral wall was then created and patched over our suture line of our cystorophy. We then mobilized the omentum and placed the omental patch down in the pelvis. A 15 French round drain was then placed in the pelvis and secured with 2 nylon suture. On post-op day one, the patient was doing well, was advanced from NPO to a clear liquid diet. And then on post-op day two, she did begin, began to pass flatus. She was tolerating a regular diet and was deemed stable for discharge home with a Foley catheter and a JP drain at that time. The patient was seen in clinic two weeks after discharge. She had a cystogram at that time that demonstrated a small amount of contained extravasation. Her Foley and JP were removed, and she has not been seen yet. She will return in clinic for two to three weeks for a follow-up appointment. This was her cystogram here, which you can see on the posterior wall, there is a small amount of contained extravasation. These are my references. And briefly, I just wanted to say thank you for all the faculty residents who can, have contributed to my education over the last three years here. I've had an incredible experience and I'm very grateful for the opportunity, so thank you. And a little urology, general surgery joke. <clears throat> Questions, comments about this? Uh, I think that the thing, I, one of the things that I thought about is uh, uh, this is one of the few times I've heard that a plain film is better than a cystogram, than a CT scan or something, which I guess is, uh, would we agree about that in terms of a cystogram and the evaluation of, a, of the trauma patient uh, from our trauma doctors, Dr. Max, what are you on? Yeah, I think a cystogram is a great tool. Uh, I think it probably has increased sensitivity. Uh, you got to get the AP lateral and then post uh, void images to really get a complete idea. Um, we cheat a lot and she scoffed us for us in her presentation about just clamping the Foley if we got somebody with a pelvic <laughs> fracture and looking for a distended bladder is a clear sign of uh, not having a bladder injury but uh, the cystogram is a gold standard and that slide you had with the indications to perform a cystogram is a great uh, reference. Um, I don't think, I'm about a PGY 27 and this is the first time I think I've heard a presentation on management of bladder injuries and I enjoyed it. Nice job, good presentation. Uh, this ought to be one of the files that the, the other residents have access to so they can review this sort of thing. I think it's something that any general surgeon in community practice should be expected to know how to do is repair bladder injuries from our GYN colleagues um, if a urologist is not available. Um, I did have one question for you. The dogma <coughs> of yesteryear was, and you didn't even mention it, which I was proud to see, but uh, used to be everybody with a bladder injury had to have a suprapubic uh, catheter. So would you care to comment on that? Are there any indications now still for a suprapubic catheter? There are. They only recommend a suprapubic catheter if there is a concomitant urethral injury or there's a reason why you can't just have drainage by a Foley. There have been a bunch of studies that show that just putting an SP tube when there's no other injuries, it doesn't do any more good than just a uh, plain um, large bore Foley catheter drainage. Great. One uh, just additional comment that I'll have, uh, I have is um, if you think there's any reason at all during a trauma laparotomy or any other procedure that would involve the bladder, 
always prep the Foley into the field. Uh, I think it uh, is a great way to test your bladder repair, disconnect the Foley drainage bag, and be able to instill saline or something into the bladder to test your repair or see if you've got a leak that you can't find just by you know examining the bladder. That, that's something you just have to think about when you're prepping. Dr. Smith? So again, I appreciate you bring up bladder injuries because we don't, do not hear about those. Um, the extravasation at the cystogram in the office, was that from the original injury? Do we think the, the small extravasation with the last cystogram we think was from the original injury? This one here. On the, yeah, posterior aspect. Yes, the office note that I read just mentioned that there was a small amount of contained extravasation and that the Foley was removed. I've questioned it and I didn't get an answer as to why the Foley was removed at that time. But yes, that I believe it was. It like a small amount of extravasation. Very small. <laughs> here in the corner. But yes, I believe it was thought that it was from the original injury. Is there any thought process why the bladder didn't heal for you? Because it, it heals 99% of the time, it, it could take a beating and still heal. I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. We do transplants, and when we make a hole in the bladder and put the uh, ureter, ureter onto the bladder, um, we take Foley out at four to five days, just give it some time to heal so the bladder doesn't stretch too much. I would suspect that maybe the patient uh, was allowing over distension of his incision site, therefore not healing very well because the edges would move too much. It was a very large large injury as well. I don't know if that possibly contributed to why it would have taken a little longer for it to heal. I bet that was interpreted as just a, a dog ear, you know, just imbricating up a bunch of inflamed tissue. I bet that's just a dog ear and that's why they took the Foley out. Uh, you know, I've had a couple of uh, cystograms that look like that after bladder repairs and, you know, I've actually left the Foley in and I think somebody just said, that's a, a diverticulum or something that was created by the nature of the repair and the heck with the Foley. Yeah, because you've dissected the superpubic space, so there's plenty of expansion room for it to, to extend into in an irregular shape. Um, I think, yeah, Dr. Dr. Fisher? You were talking about, you were talking about um, extra peritoneal injuries. Yes, sir. And that a lot of times you can just put a Foley in give it a couple of weeks, it'll heal, and that's all you have to do. Does that, there a form of, of treating the injury, does that ever result in, in a light hernia of the bladder somehow or diverticulum of the bladder, do you know? Not in my, I didn't encounter that in my reading. So apparently it scars in and, and, and it doesn't lead to any kind of long-term problem with the bladder that you have to fix later on. No, not that I read, not in terms of a hernia or any sort of diverticulum, no, sir. I think one other thing that just for uh, out of interest, this is one of the, if you heard her just mention what happened at the initial procedure, they closed, closed the injury with chromic. And chromic suture is something that, you know, just almost uh, you don't hear of anymore. But it has, per, uh, I think it's persisted in, in closing bladder issues in urology more than any other place I know of in surgery. I don't know of any other areas where it is. Uh, are you guys using chromic like for, to close your cystal orifice in uh, transplant? Because I, I didn't either. I mean, I always used Vicryl or something else. But I use a lot of PDS. Right, okay. But you use something absorbable, that's for sure. But, uh, but, but one of the, one, when you try to dissect why this might have happened, I really wonder if that might be it. Chromic suture is, you know, first of all, it's likely to be old sitting on the shelf because nobody's using it anymore. Uh, and it tends, to, it tends to separate and dissolve much earlier than other suture material does. And uh, so I really wonder if that might not have been a part of the technical issues. Well, I mean, we'll have any way of knowing it. I'm just speculating about why it would not work, you know, because it looked like the whole thing fell apart, you know, in one day. And uh, if you've ever sown anything much with chromic, which, of course, none of you have had the pleasure of doing that, 
that's not an uncommon thing to see it broken. Uh, we still uh, use a lot of chromic in uh, the emergency room, sewing up facial lacs <laughs> and things like that when we send people out and don't want to have to have them come back here just to have their sutures removed and let it fall out. Uh, and we use it uh, when we're I've adhering. I've heard that one, but that's... <laughs> And we, uh, we use it uh, putting down skin grafts so you don't have to go back and pluck suture out of somebody's skin graft. That, and uh, we still use it on uh, liver injuries, that big... Uh, liver injuries? Why would you use it on a liver injury? They have that big blunt uh, yeah. needle yeah, that you can take uh, big bites with and really... Yeah. It's like try a number one or something like that. Yes, uh, yeah. I think it's a z zero or number one. And I, yeah. I think they used to have a number one, I know for sure, yeah. Well, that, well, that's a good point. I, I'm glad you brought that up. I, uh, I just haven't used it a long time myself. Dr. Murray? One thing I thought was a great presentation, but <clears throat> I've, I've repaired a number of bladders, and, and most of time my urology colleagues thank me rather than chastise me for not waking them up in the middle of the night when I was repairing the rectum from the GYNs. But could you just speak briefly to if there was an injury in the bladder, you know, versus you know, the top of the bladder versus somewhere down low, where where would you, where would be the areas that you would recommend getting a urologic your uh, urologic consult regardless if it's 3 a.m. if the bladder occurs and in, in the injury is in what particular area? I think if you're more concerned that it involves your ureteral orifices or if there's any damage to the ureters, I think that would be more of a reason. Or if you're concerned about long, if the patient going to need long-term fo urologic follow-up, that it might be a reason. Obviously, if you're in an emergent trauma situation, you're dealing, you know, splenectomy, et cetera, it might not be a good time to call a urologist. But I think if you're concerned with the other urologic um, organs involved, that it would be a more appropriate time to call. Dr. That's me. You did make a good point about you made an anterior cystotomy to find the injury and repair it, and that is a great way to get down low in the bladder to find it because sometimes it's hard to mobilize it up and approach from the outside so always keep that in mind as far as the chromic goes uh, I like running chromic on the mucosal layer and then a running vicryl on the outside that will hold a little longer than the chromic will yeah, I can hold a lot longer than, than chromic does if you go back in on patients with chromic it's, it's gone pretty quick a um, couple of other technical points I, I'm glad you mentioned about the suprapubic Bob because I've seen urologists stick those things in in bladder injuries years ago that, you know and think my god why are we doing this I mean you have to dissect more down get down to the anterior bladder I'm sure you guys have seen it transplant world as well and you think why are we doing this this is you know unnecessary trauma uh, so I'm glad to hear that a foley has finally been uh, in fact, we got to where we would hide them from the urologist and just put the Foley in and fix them so we didn't have to put up with criticism about it, you know, because it just made no sense whatsoever, and that's 45 years ago. I mean, <clears throat> it just didn't make any sense. Bob, you want to respond to that? Well, yeah, they were just very morbid, uh, unnecessary uh, built in suspenders. I don't, I never figured it out even when we were doing it, why. That was, it was just the law of the land. You had a bladder injury, you got a super pubic tube and a Foley in. Well, you were, going to be, you were going to be criticized by your urology colleagues if you didn't do it that way, uh, I think. The other thing that's kind of fallen by the wayside uh, historically was uh, anybody that had a gunshot wound to the abdomen, you, everybody got a one-shot IVP to make sure that you had two kidneys so that if you had to do a nephrectomy or not, you'd know if the, you had another kidney to, for the patient to function on. And that was like, that was just the stupidest thing every year in the abdomen, look and see if there are two kidneys, right? <laughs> um, and so that faded away. Um, I'll However, just say, let me just point out that one of the first people we put on dialysis in Memphis had their one kidney removed for relatively minor trauma at another hospital and then couldn't figure out why they weren't making urine. <laughs> and Oops. that was one of the first when peritoneal dialysis first came along in the late 60s. And that, uh, <clears throat> so, you know, one experience does not a series make, but that does happen. Well, I guess it got started somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, one, that one ended up with a fairly substantial malpractice settlement against the other people because it was because the IVP wasn't done. And the solitary kidney was removed <clears throat> for a relatively minor injury, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, exposed, the other thing, you, you know, you gave a detailed uh, uh, description 
of how you got there. And I think the one thing to point out that, that uh, for, res for sur general surgery residents is we don't generally make our midline incisions that far down in the pelvis. And to get to the bladder well, uh, you need to do that. It's sort of like getting to the to the rectum. You know, if you, if you go, if you work with a colorectal surgeon, out of habit they will they will go further down on their midline incision. And uh, to get to the bladder well, you do need to extend that, and it makes it a whole lot easier to do, uh, at least in my experience. Um, I think uh, I would encourage the residents to discuss those cases with Dr. Murray because he's out there in, in practice down in South Georgia where he was the general surgeon around. You do, you do encounter these things, and this is a frequent, once again, board, uh, oral board exam question that, you know, have you thought about a bladder injury with hematuria, microhematuria, uh, and do you know how to get there and how to fix it? Because it is one circumstance where just like this, this general surgeon at the other hospital clearly got called in, you know, to do something. Or, or the urologist did, I guess. It was the urologist. The urologist in this case. Any other questions or comments, Eva? I'll just emphasize what Dr. Murray said about being able to repair these in community practice and not call in urology. Right. Uh, it's a little shameful to admit, but 15 plus years ago here, you couldn't get a urologist to come into the operating room on a Sunday afternoon and help you with something like that. They just would not come. It wasn't until Dr. Wheelock uh, reinvented urology around here and got a new team of urologists. So you may find communities as a general surgeon where a urologist is not going to want to help you whatever time of day it is. Uh, well, they've seen, uh, you know, in a community where they've been in practice for a while, they've seen fewer bladder injuries than you have, you know, uh, probably. And the other comment I'll make is about the extraperitoneal bladder ruptures. We see that a lot with these acetabular pelvic fractures and orthopedics takes those patients to the operating room and you need to be on standby to repair those. It's actually usually the injury is right there. Uh, it's next to the fracture. It's easy to see. They open, they close. You just come in, repair the bladder and, you know, tell them to leave the Foley in for a week. And so, so there's a lot of I've seen people get real worked up. Oh my God, we got to fix a bladder with a pelvic fracture. Blah blah. It's really a, just a really nice case. Well, they fixed an acetabular fracture, so they've done. The, uh, they do this big ilioinguinal incision and basically lift all the abdominal viscera off of the inside of the pelvis, oh, and the okay. bladder will just be sitting there, and the the injury is usually flapping in the breeze. I thought you said close the incision, the so you do you do the repair through that incision. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, was thinking you're it's it's a movie. very impressive exposure that they do for right, that okay. right. eight-hour surgery. And yeah. Okay. Well, excellent uh, presentation and, and good luck in your life as a urologist and in your training coming up. Thank you very much. <laughs>